Thank you for having me and thank you for coming out. Um, I'm going to be talking today about issues in Native America um, from the lens of my own work, which is creative writing. And why is creative writing an important way for me to be active in environmental issues and in the Native American cause? Because it makes people feel viscerally the experiences and the lives of people on the reservation. That kind of a didactic political approach would not be able to do. So that's why I entered into this field. Anytime that we can create sort of an emotion in our reader, um, we are sure that what they have learned from us will stay with them. At the same time, part of what I will be talking about today is the fact that on Native American reservations, there's somewhat of a taboo about telling personal stories. We've all heard um, these issues of appropriation. How many of you saw the commercial recently online with the blonde woman, I don't know if it was for the Gap, they had to take it down, where she's in a Lakota headdress. And she's like, I think she's dancing to dubstep, which a lot of people got up in arms with. So we'll be talking about some of those issues. But the main issue that I wanted to talk about today was um, like the environmental causes that are happening, not just on the reservation, but worldwide. So imagine an urban couple who, after running their kids from one activity to the next, plop down on the couch to watch the evening news. Images flip by their half-closed perception. Foreigners in distant lands, environmental catastrophes, drug busts in cities they've never visited, rapes and other crime. Their level of retention is small. Though the images create anxiety in them, the impact passes once the television is turned off. Imagine a poor rural family on a southern Arizona Indian reservation. Their electricity has been shut off because they failed to pay their bill. But it's warm outside. They decide to jerry-rig their car battery to run the television and satellite receiver in the front yard. They throw sleeping bags down in the dirt and block out the sound of the desert by turning up the volume on their favorite sitcoms and news programs. In this incredible unification of the American mind, they see the same images as the urban couple, and they too receive the images somewhat passively. Regardless of who we are and where we come from, we are increasingly inundated with images. What do we know of the world? What do we understand of our fellow Americans? We gather much of our information from sound clips and scriptwriters without actually going out to interact with other peoples. The television itself has become a giant pacifier, a glowing lullaby that makes people drowsy before heading off to bed. As a result, news of the world and news of each other has lost its efficacy and its political import. As soon as one scandal is over, a new one starts. The information piles up with no foreground or background to contextualize it. And our connections, they begin to fall apart, right? So how to reach people in a world where we're all dealing with a little bit of compassion fatigue, OK? We've had hurricanes. We've had Wall Street collapse. Tomorrow we have the election cycle. We didn't talk much about the environment. How important is the environment to us when we're worried so much about our financial well-being, for example? So that's one reason why I come at this with a, a perspective that the creative world and creative genres can help. So I'm going to start with a poem about my father. It's called the Four Corners Power Plant, which is a power plant on the Navajo Reservation in northeastern Arizona. He works in a smoking steel dragon, melting metal together on the Navajo Reservation, where they rip coal from her insides to burn and spin in turbines, transforming earth to light and TV and energy for this computer. Even if he hates it, there is satisfaction in more than survival. A paycheck from the front line where he's disguised as enemy amidst inventions galore, shoulder to shoulder with magic from that other land, wizards bearing down with superior gods they call science. It worries me that natives are buying food with blood money hanging on to jobs that suck the earth dry, knee-deep in pollution 
and unhappy about it, but unwilling to step out and starve. Afraid to get jobs that reflect New Age bunk, I've never seen a Hopi massage therapist or a Navajo Reiki master charging a hundred bucks an hour, and I wonder how I'd feel if I did. But in the meantime, we pound this American drum until it bleeds, fill huge holes with sand, and stretch odd-shaped band-aids across earth wounds growing too big to heal. I wanted to start with this. It's such a simple image, but what I'd like you to, to kind of see and look at is the, um, I don't know how to point, but you can see up there on the breast at the top, there are two American flags, one facing out and one facing in. This is from the Helena, Montana Museum, History Museum. And in, during World War II, those were very, very popular motifs for beadwork, right? And you can tell that the dresses, the powwow regalia, the buckskin dresses from that era, you can always tell they're from that era when they have flags. Why? Because Native Americans were very patriotic at that time. And it was because there was a war. We had a lot of our tribal members, our uncles, our grandparents who were going to fight. And my aunts, a lot of them went to work at that time as welders and nurses. We've all heard the story of Rosie the Riveter. That happened to us too on the reservation. Um, but although we have a lot of pride for our veterans, um, I would say also that um, I've, I've, I was taught to distrust patriotism in some way. I wanted to start uh, my talk with this, that I, I do have a bias. I do have fears about the government. It was fed to me as a child. It's my historic inheritance. And so I was raised a little angry, and I still have some distrust. I'm wary of Wall Street. I'm worried about the elections tomorrow. Let's just start with that as a sort of confession and a bias that I have. A person does not lightly elect to oppose his society. This is what the essayist James Baldwin wrote, who did a wonderful job in race relations uh, when he was alive during the civil rights. And the interesting thing about him was he refused to join with the kind of militant portions of his society, but neither did he want to walk with the peacekeepers he tread a middle line. And that's what I'm going to talk about today, like this need in Native America for us to under, for me to, for me personally to say that I have benefited a lot from America. I've benefited from the energy sources that we have, from the coal that's been dug, at the same time that it's antithetical to the philosophical ideas that I was raised with. So I saw my father when he worked at that power plant that I just talked about, and all the other Navajo men that worked there as well, they suffered a great deal because they didn't have the education to get better jobs, but at the same time, they knew what they were doing. It was not satisfying and right for them, okay? Um, so I consider myself an emigrant, right, from the Southwest. I received benefits from living in the country, but also I kind of am not, not sure, I've never been sure, even as a child, like where I fit in the country. Once I left the reservation, and I moved into cities, I felt the same as your grandparents, perhaps, that had come from Europe, in some ways, very displaced, right? And it took me many years, so I'm 43 now, it took me many years to figure out what the crux of my dilemma was. I used to say that my life was a Zen Cohen, that I couldn't figure it out, that it was so difficult for me to decide how to act. I was having an existential crisis, right? The problem with being born was, what did I do with my life that felt right? And I have finally been able to boil it down to the fact that it really was a search for a moral code. What ethics, as a Native American, could I adopt to be a good American citizen? How could I be a good American citizen? And part of the, the, the conflict for me was my grandma Esther, who grew up at Laguna Pueblo. And here's the church, St. Joseph's. And yet, on Christmas Eve, they have the eagle dance. So there's a melding between the indigenous spiritual systems of, our, of her tribe, of my tribe, and the Catholicism that I was raised with. Now, my grandmother Esther was so devout. She would say rosaries all the time. She was very committed. As a girl, she was afraid of her own tribal ceremonies. She was the only one of my four grandparents that was affected in this way. She wanted so earnestly to be holy, and she was so afraid 
that those practices and the dances and the celebration of the earth would damn her, that, that it was uh, something that was heathen, that would hurt her soul. And so I grew up listening to her be very frightened and say that she could not go down and partake. Her mother wouldn't let her. And so this was one voice in my life that splintered the other things that I heard from my other grandparents. Yes? And I also went to Catholic schools when I grew up because in New Mexico, the, school, the public school system and the reservation school system is very poor. So when my father started working at the power plant, he said, we're going to send you to Catholic schools. That way, when you're my age, you can be doing something positive for our people. So he kind of pushed us ahead with that sacrifice, yes? This is my grandfather, who uh, I wanted to explain that in my family, though I am, um, my mother is Latina, my father's full-blood Native American, my mother has some Indian blood, but my dad has four different tribes. My grandma was Laguna, her husband was Yuma, Quetzan. I was born in Yuma, Arizona. His grandmother was a Shoshone, Paiute. The reason why it's so splintered was because of the Indian boarding school era, right? When the government came in and the, the families didn't have enough to live on after the Dawes Act, the Allotment Act, a lot of land was lost. And so they were sent off. That was my father's generation. And his parents went as well. So what happened when they arrived at these schools, they became what I would call indigenous Christians, indigenous Catholics that kind of melded together the old world with the new. They hung on to some of their traditions. But the important thing for my family was that a lot of them rebelled. And rather than agreeing to, to marry the person that they were betrothed to back at home, they married somebody from another tribe. So my father was the first English speaker in our family because his mother and his father spoke Yuman and Laguna and they were not compatible at all, right? And this is an interesting photo actually, you can't see it very well, but my grandfather was from Yuma, but he's wearing, everybody, if you can see, he's wearing like a Lakota Plains Indian headdress, which would not have been his traditional clothing, it was his wife's. And she's the one that, that fixed that for him. And he played in this band called the Fort Yuma Marching Band, the Fort Yuma Indian Band. And they got um, selected to go play at the inauguration of President Eisenhower. And when they showed up on the East Coast from Yuma with these head bonnets, they were made fun of by people from other tribes who said, why are you wearing Plains Indian headdresses when you're from the desert? And they tried to explain about the intermarriage, but at the same time, they felt challenged and unsure about their identity. So that sort of loss of identity is crucial to my story, to who I am. It took me a long time to figure out what I valued and who I was for that sort of a fragmentation and society reflecting on that fragmentation in me, right? So I just wanted to show you a map of the general area that I'm from. I would be all New Mexico and Arizona here, just above this body of water right there's the river, the Colorado River that goes up and you'll see the word Yuma. So we're the five Colorado River tribes. I was the first child in my family not to be born on the reservation because my older brother died uh, at the Indian Health Services. Uh, they, they neglected to find um, a problem in him when he was born and he only lived for two days. And after that they said, this is too dangerous, the services here are not good enough. So I was actually the first child in my family that was born across the river in Yuma rather than on the reservation. So my culture that I feel closest to in my family is the human culture. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about us. You'll notice here that our traditional hair was dreadlocks, <coughs> river dreadlocks, like you might see in Rastafarian people, right? And so the people would go down to the river and roll their hair in the mud until they had this dread look, okay? And we were known in a very um, kind of a crude way to be a digger tribe, which would mean that we did not have a lot of clothing, we did not have a lot of arts and crafts, we did not have pottery, this set us apart from other southwestern Indian tribes, but it was a philosophy. There was a non-emphasis on material wealth. Everything involved dreaming and song cycles, which is one of the reasons why I'm going to Australia, 
because they also have a desert terrain and they have dream time, which is a very sort of unusual commonality for us to have as desert people. I almost wonder if the desert induces that in us. But what it is is the idea that your dreams are more real than the world, the waking world. You've all seen The Matrix. Something kind of similar to that, right? Where when the earliest explorers arrived, and it was a long time ago when they came, because they came up that body of water up to the river, they tried to ask about the history of the tribe, and people in my tribe, they could not talk about seasons and histories. They just, they didn't care about that. They wanted to talk about their dreams. So there was a lack of ceremonies and rituals. There was a great emphasis on warfare as a semi-religious activity. And uh, they said that we were really tall and big and large and good swimmers because there was the river there. And I'll get into some of the, the concerns about the Colorado River as it's impacted my family as we move ahead. So you guys have heard of Bartholome de las Casas, yeah? When I was a young girl growing up at Catholic school, I cared a lot, a great deal about my Catholic faith. And I was always very concerned about how to reconcile this Jesus that I saw, that I loved, and the stories of Catholicism with my own indigenous stories. And I think that part of that split is the reason why this is a chart that shows the alcohol use, the drug abuse, that we have very high incidence of suicide. I would make the argument, coming from the background that I have and the experiences that I have, that that split is very traumatic and real, and that it's very hard to find a way to combine the things. One of the reasons why I love Bartolome de las Casas, obviously, is because when he was w working and living in Central and South America at the time of colonization, and he saw what was happening with the indigenous people and how they were abused, he said that he saw in them the living face of Jesus, scourged and beaten and not cared for on the earth. And to hear a priest, and later I found other saints that said similar things, very wonderful saints, that made me continue to have faith that you could be, you, that Catholicism could be a beautiful thing. And uh, probably in my teens, I found a quote by Pope John Paul II that said, indigenous people were ripe for conversion to Christianity and Catholicism because the notion of the communion of saints is very similar to our notion of the ancestors, right? And so even my grandparents that did not fully embrace Catholicism, they still, they did a combination. And I would just want to make you all consider for a minute, because I know for a lot of people that sounds really unusual and odd. Like, what does this mean? But when we think about the Christmas tree as an image that we all have in our homes, and we think about the origins of the symbol of the Christmas tree, we know that it comes from old world cultures, Druid cultures in Europe, right? So at any sort of time when there's the death of an epistemological worldview and the rise of another, people who are adopting new religions, they want to hold on to some of the family traditions. They want to hold on to some of the family rituals. And the Pope is, I think has been, the Popes along, through the years have been in varying degrees very accepting of that as a needed uh, sort of um, an, uh, a tolerant approach to watching the world in different places become Catholic. I traveled in West Africa, and there they had dogs in the church. And it was, the priests were very fine with that. And I had a friend who went to Japan. And on Easter, she went to mass with all her pastel clothes. And everyone in the church was wearing blood red. And she was like, why is everybody dressed in red? And they said, well, in Japan on Easter, you wear red. And she never realized that there were cultural differences from one part of the world to another in the way it was the way people, they didn't have the Easter baskets. They didn't have the Easter bunny. They didn't have the same colors. So a lot of what we think of as a permanent aspect of our faith or of Catholicism, as you travel and as you spread wider and you go and you meet new cultures, you realize that it's, it's the Nicene Creed and the Apostles' Creed. There are basics that we agree with, and there are, there are differences. So I'm always all about tolerance when I talk to people about my history with this. Okay. So as I said before, what is good? How do I behave in a way that reflects my highest morals and principles? Which is the best version of faith and devotion for me? So I'm going to read you our Kuchan creation story. 
it's, it's been crafted to be poetic by me. So it's not like a, you would hear maybe my, my grandparents tell it. Um, it's called The Good Twin and the Evil Twin. In the beginning there was water. This is how the world began. There was nothingness and there was water. There was no land, no sky, no shoreline, no lapping edge, no place where opposing forms might clash or meet. There was no sun or moon, no rain or dry breeze, no reflected clouds. With nothing to mirror the water, the world was invisible. Then out of the water arose a mist. It formed our limitless sky. Deep in the belly of the water, Kokomot, the creator, became visible. He pondered the mist, he pondered the sky, and he had his first idea. From his bodiless, nameless, motionless state, he thought to emerge on the heels of the mist. From the watery world, he rose up. But he was only half of a whole. He was twins. The waters boiled and frothed and rushed out of the bubbles and loam like a giant towering tree of ash. The good twin, Kokomot, came out and stretched his arms. With his eyes closed to protect his sight, he sliced through the water to stand. Each of his steps along its surface crashed like charcoal thunder. He threw back his watery dreadlocks, opened his eyes, and saw. I named myself Kokomot, all-powerful yet dual, the progenitor of being. A voice from beneath the waters called out to Kokomot, Tell me, brother, my other half, all-powerful, how did you rise up? Was it with closed eyes or open eyes? No one else was there to hear this voice, the voice of the evil twin. But Kokomot heard, Kokomot thought. From his bodiless, nameless, motionless state, he had his second idea. He knew his twin's intentions were evil, and so he lied to him. I came with my eyes open, he called. And this is how the evil twin emerged out of the water. Jostled by the waves his brother's birth had caused, with his eyes wide open to the world, he was immediately blinded. By robbing him of his sight, by maiming him of his ability to create the good twin, Kokomot, held him in check and went on to create the world on his own as he saw it, to build and build with little competition from his evil twin or his evil twin's opinion. He was hindered by the lack of sight and he sank back into the water out of despair. This is the story of how the evil twin went back, disappearing with a crash. He threw up a spray of confusion and sickness as he did. And ever since, we have had misunderstanding between brothers. We have had bodily ills and death. We have had hearts that ache in both love and despair. I might have been a freaky little kid. I'm sure I was. I was always very kind of listening to avant-garde music and doing things on the reservation that were not typical of kids from rural New Mexico. But I never trusted the story. I always had a problem with it because I said, if there were just the two of them there when the world began, and the good twin started his life with a lie that injured his brother, how can I define that as good? How do I de define that? is good. It's such a small and significant thing, but I think it shows a lot about my psychology as a child. I'll read you one more essay before we get to the end about my uncle's funeral when I was young. It was the earliest funeral I ever saw. But to kind of illustrate this grappling between what does it mean to care about the earth? Is it bad to say that I have something in common with animals, that I have something to appreciate in this old world culture that my grandparents gave me. And so I come to speak about animal and earth wisdom. And we can see here that this is a replica. This is again at a museum in Montana. Um, actually, it's outside that same museum. It's the Helena Montana History Museum. 
and it's a bison skull. And here are the, bi the jackets, right? So there, has been a, there have been a lot of arguments now in the recent years about really how committed are Native Americans to the environment when you go to the reservation and what do you see? You see dirty diapers in the parking lot, you see broken glass, you see poverty. I don't see anybody there that's doing environmental writing or environmental, what, you know, it, it, it's, it could just totally be a facade that you ever were ecological warriors, you ever cared about things. This, this is like, um, this is one of the things that I write about a lot because I think we are so inherently connected to animals in our fate that it's a ridiculous question to ask in some ways, right? The bison were killed across the plains as a way of helping a kind of push out that sort of a natural lifestyle that would enable the Lakota to keep fighting and to stay where they were. Once the bison were dead, a way of life died, and there's no returning to it. When I talk about the death of an episteme or the death of an epistemological sort of view, epistemological viewpoint on the world, that's what I'm saying. There was no way for those people in the late 1800s to return to the culture that they had always known. I'm talking about food. I'm talking about um, like what you did in your day-to-day -day life, right? There's no way. It was completely destroyed when the bison were killed. This on the right is an army jacket, standard government issue. Everyone got these buffalo jackets. And I've been doing some research on um, this era, and I was shocked to come up with this notion of bone black paint. A lot of artists like to use bone black paint because it's so black in an old Caravaggio, it absorbs the gaze. The only way bone black, pla bone black paint can be made is by crushing down bone and making it with actual bone. So an entire industry developed after the bison were killed and there were bones all over. You could get bison dollars. So pioneer families would go out and collect bones on Saturday and Sunday morning and they would ship them to a place that gave them bison dollars where they could go buy supplies and food or whatever. Became a mini industry. As it started to disappear, and they didn't knew that there was no more bones that they could char and turn into this bone black paint, the industry got kind of uh, nervous, like what's gonna happen and how are we gonna do this? And, so if you go to the makers of this bone, back plant, uh, this bone black paint to this day, what happened was, as the buffalo bones on the prairie became scarce, scavengers raided um, old Indian cer cer uh, ceremonial cemeteries for the bones. And there was a great rift in the industry because the human bones caused huge arguments, right? And finally, after several years, the human bones were unacceptable for the industry and they stopped making bone black out of American bone, right? But first it was bison bone and then it was Indian bones. So that's, you know, that's one way in which I say all of our lifestyle had to do with the land. All of our lifestyle had to do with these animals that we considered our brethren. We did feel very responsible. And not only that, but our demise, our death throes, the death of the way we had lived, it's, it's connected to them as well. I don't know much about this. I've lived a life that has been very, very, fairly privileged, like I tell you. I went to Catholic school. My father had difficulties when I was a child. I saw that. But I call his generation the generation that inherited kind of mental shock. Shock was their inheritance because they didn't know the old way of life that people who were born in 1900 and 1910 were. My father was born in the earliest years of 1940 and he is the lost generation, the generation that sacrificed their lives to push their kids away. Some of you might have had parents that did that if you come from families that worked in coal mines. Their life is a wash. Their lives are horrible. My father would come home like full of grime, exhausted every night, unhappy. So I claim this environmental legacy, I do. And I don't want to sound didactic and preachy when I write about it. That's one reason why I bend toward the creative, because it's a softer way of talking about it. But I, I, I affirm it, and I have a quote here by Luther Standing Bear. The man who sat on the ground in his teepee meditating on life and its meaning 
accepting the kinship of all creatures and acknowledging unity with the universe of things was infusing into his being the true essence of civilization. And when native man left off this form of development, his humanization was retarded in growth. I love that quote for two words. One is civilization. It's the same thing that I'm asking about ethics and more. What does it mean to be civilized? Does it mean that you're civilized if you don't have to worry where your children are, are at night because there's nobody in your village that would hurt them? If they didn't show up for dinner, you know that they're sitting at somebody else's dinner table? They have a period of childhood. They're doing pretty well. Everybody's fed. We don't let anybody starve. Our leaders are often the poorest people because they give so much away. How do we define civilization? I was scarred as a child by this notion that I was not civilized or that I was somehow heathen by my birthright. And I struggled a lot to prove that I was good because I love the nuns who raised me. They were very good nuns, actually. I had Ursuline nuns at my school. So this was the school I went to up in the corner, Sacred Heart Catholic School in Farmington, New Mexico. This is the power plant where my father worked, which I could go into deeper, but we'll probably keep moving a little faster. If tomorrow I'm giving a talk in a class that's the, you know, it's an environmental, a class that's concerned with environmental concerns, we could talk about it more. But for now, the most important thing to know is that the scrubbers at this unit, the things that would clean the pollution that's going into the air are very, very poor. This will eventually be shut down. It's one of the dirtiest coal mining power plants in the United States. It's had a horrible effect on the Navajo tribe. And the Navajo Tribal Council is partly responsible for it. Okay, whether or not people say they were illegally elected and put on to council or how it played out, that's not my place to know. Every tribe is different. I've never voted with the Navajo people. I don't know, but I know that still, I read an article this summer where now they're in a point where they have to protect jobs. So there are Navajo people that work at the power plant. They don't want to lose their jobs. At the same time, people are getting sick. My mother lived here for a long time. She got a very rare form of lung, lung cancer that only non-smokers get. And we think it was because we lived for so long near Shiprock where this power plant is. So I've heard my father talk about this my whole life. He was always pushing to have scrubbers put on, to have things changed. But again, like I said, it was very, he was very world weary by the time he hit his 60s because he had lived in a way that was an embarrassment for all of us. It was really upsetting for me to talk about in my initial talks. I didn't want to admit that I had had that life. And this is where I was born. This is the Yuma Crossing. On the far side of the river is Arizona. On this side of the river is California, okay? Just about 15 miles south, you would cross the Mexico border. Nobody knows about the Yuma Crossing, or very few people too, but it's hugely important in American history because there's a huge bend in the river where it got small, and before they had dams, right, before there were dams, seven of them along the Colorado River, that river was fast. They called it the, you know, it was like the delta in the desert. And every year it would come down and it would explode the banks and spread across the desert. And when it receded, my ancestors would come back and all they had to do was poke a few watermelon, melon, beans, squash, and then they could just back up. They barely had to weed. So to own that patch of land for all the years that they did made them a very mighty kind of fierce tribe that was able to protect it because it was easy living. It was easy living, right? What happened was that in 1848, when they discovered gold in California, everyone came across the country from the east. And when they got to the river to cross with cattle and wagons and women and children, and it was so wide, they all hung a left. And they went down and they went down to the Yuma Crossing where it bent. And that's where they would cross their cattle. And in the earliest years, a lot of people from my tribe, they call us Yuma, we would say Quetzan. They would be there to swim the horses across, to pull the wagons across, and they would pick up coins, right? But what happened was there were so many people, it was like the huge giant locust swarm that you read about in the Bible. All the crops got trampled. And the people with livestock let their animals eat the crops. So within a few years, we, 
everyone was starving. And the army had to build a garrison there. And it's so funny, I have a slide that says that the garrison was built to protect the soldiers and the settlers. If they really had done their homework, a lot of it was to protect the, the tribe, actually, because there, wa there was warfare starting with some people from Mexico who were trying to set up a crossing. and It was like three ways, but a lot of people from my tribe were being killed. So they were protected by the US Army. That's how we became Fort Yuma. It's a garrison, right? And that is eternally shameful to come from a tribe that is a fort tribe. That's something that none of you would know, but it is. When you meet other native people, you know, you always admire the Apaches or the Lakotas that they fought for their way of life. They fought that for their families to the very end. So for us to have given up so early as a tribe that kind of valued the sort of a strength and kind of, you know, the spiritual warfare that was common in Native America, it was embarrassing for us to have that happen to us. So we actually were affected by American history much sooner than most of the desert natives around us. And this is just talking on the left about 1540 when uh, Alarcon first came, just to show how far back history in this area goes. So this is the, um, one of the things that Yuma is very famous for is the old territorial prison, where they kept criminals like this guy on the bottom. And this is my father making fun behind a Yuma criminal thing at a restaurant downtown. It's a family restaurant called Lutz Casino. The funny thing is, after they shut this uh, old territorial prison down, you could still go see all the old cells and everything, they put the high school in there. So Yuma High School was in the old territorial prison, and to this day, the mascot for the high school is the criminals. So if you play <laughs> basketball for the high school, you're the Yuma criminals, right? So that's kind of a funny little thing about that area. This is the more of the impact that I have seen in my lifetime on the Colorado River. The, the, what happened was, in 1909, the territorial prison was shut down. And the steamboat line was closing because the largest mines had closed, right? And so now they were talking about getting irrigation water supplied and they built Laguna Dam. Laguna Dam was the first dam built. We all know Hoover Dam, which is huge, right? And this is the type of stuff that they would do to dive. You know, it was the old, it, this was, they used the old diving equipment to build the Laguna Dam. Yuma gets the first dam on the Colorado River. The unintended consequences of the dam. They've altered the ecosystem around the river. So now we have this invading species called salt cedar, right, that has come in. The cottonwoods are dying. And uh, it's also affected, like, the birds and uh, non-native vegetation. They have, um, it has kind of erupted in a lot of weeds. And the fish are dying as well. There's always compromise, yeah? Because now our industry has become the casino. But first, let's go back to this for a second about the, the Colorado River. We know that the Colorado River now supplies water to Los Angeles, Phoenix, Las Vegas, right? There is an old prophecy in my, father, um, in my father's family that I've heard come down for ages that someday there will be a lot of wars over water, that there won't be enough water on the planet. And, um, they worry a lot down there about the quality of the water as it arrives in Yuma. I lived there, the last time I lived on the reservation was about 10 years ago. I lived there for three years. And the water is brackish, it's red. And when you wash your clothes, they get beat up and they get turned red really easily. The whites get dyed by the clay and the hardness. And so um, my, uh, my tribe recently, tried to start to reintroduce some of the original um, plants and trees that would have thrived in this area in just a small section to show what it used to look like, right? And here I come back around to um, some of the creative writing that I'm going to read to you. I'm gonna, I am going to read to you from this essay, but I wanted to say that telling the stories of my people, it's always hard to say who I represent because I come from different tribes. And maybe I worry too much about this, but this sort of a fear of appropriation, I want people to understand a little bit. It's important to me because the historic loss of land and the historic loss of lives, it has an effect on people if they feel that they've ex experienced genocide. So if you look at any culture that has lost a lot of people and has had a lot of violence, 
The thing that happens in the 20, 30, 40 years that follow is kind of a closing up of the wagons, a circling of the wagons, where you're going to protect your own. You're going to protect your ways. You're going to be very, very, un, not very trusting of outsiders, right? So I have cousins, for example, on the reservation. And if some of you said, I would love to learn more about Native American belief systems as they pertain to your tribe, because we know that we're very diverse tribes across the country. I have cousins who would say, you know, I don't want them to sit in a sweat with me. I don't want them to come and try to learn about my culture. I don't want them to try to learn about my faith or my spirituality, because they're just trying to steal it. So we've gone from the Dawes Act, the Allotment Act, you know, the broken treaties, the things that were physically stolen from us, we've come down now to protecting ideas, to protecting stories, to protecting self and religion. And it's a fear, right? It's a fear. And I, I've grappled with that for a long time. We all know in my generation, the most famous author that we have is Sherman Alexie. And he's persona non grata on his reservation. A lot of people there don't like him because he told stories. He wasn't supposed to tell these stories. And the question that I continue to ask is, don't we have something to offer? Can't we get around that? I went to an overseas writing workshop in the Philippines uh, two summers ago, and I met this wonderful author, a Filipino author. I was in his conference, and I was in his class. It was a workshop. Right. And they had share a similar history as I do in the Southwest because they were colonized by, Spanish, by, by the Spaniards, right? And he was talking about how Spanish people, uh, especially, well, some of the priests and some of the, you know, the business owners, if they had a young Filipino kid that tried to speak in their language, they would get mad and say, no, you do not try to adopt our language. And then someone came out and said, this is wrong. If you want to colonize a people, the best way to do it, when you know that they are colonized, is when they want exactly what you want. When they want what you want and what you prize most, then they've been colonized. Which brings us to capitalism. And this idea that I see in hip hop a lot of times with young men that come from indigenous families, that they have turned completely on the traditional values that would have been espoused by my tribe, which was a tolerance for, for gay, lesbian, transgender people, which was a tolerance for women having power in society, right? To what is completely antithetical, they are worshiping capitalism. Their minds have been colonized, and yet they think they're protecting something by not telling people their stories. And I say maybe it's time for some reverse colonization. We see people that have tattoos. Average people did not have tattoos way back when. My father had tattoos when it was not cool to have tattoos because they meant something. So we see that as a culture, we're merging together. And what from our worldview do we have to offer? And what do we gain by being protective of who we are? So I thought about this so much, I think I came up with one of the reasons why we're this way. And it's crazy. Of course, we need humor, but we also need what I have been writing about and I call the distant perspective. And the way that I like to talk about it is in conjunction with this film, Nanook of the North. Nanook in the North is the first documentary that was ever made. It's a silent documentary, right? And the concept was, the Eskimos are disappearing. They're dying. They're going to be gone. Their culture is dead. If we don't get a camera and head north immediately and film everything about them, we're going to lose recording. They're going extinct. And while it's true that their beliefs and traditions maybe are, have you know, changed, everybody changes. None of us are stuck in time. And the only culture that doesn't change is a dead culture, right? If you see um, something in a museum, it means that it's dead. It's not changing anymore. So I thought about this. I thought a lot of, as a child about how I was, I was taught this myth of the disappearing Indian. I was taught to be afraid that we were disappearing. And I actually think it, it, 
That, along with the fear of using birth control if you're Catholic in Indian country, produces big family. My mom is one of 15 kids. My dad is one of 10. I was one of seven. I have five children. That's how serious we take the, the teachings about life on the reservation. It's true. It's just the way we are, right? It might also be this urge to recreate what we think we've lost, which is population. So then suddenly, though, last year when they came out with this new census that said that the Latino population in America was booming and expanding so much, and I looked at my friend, Jose Orduño, who's Mexican, and I thought, well, I call you Mexican and you speak Spanish, but actually, you look native. You have Aztec blood or Mayan blood or Toltec blood or, you know, I can clearly see. <coughs> And then I traveled south of the border to Central America and Mexico. And I thought more and more and more. And I thought, you know what? We became so obsessed with Manifest Destiny. Manifest Destiny, this movement east to west that crushed everything. And that's what we think of as America. We say, I'm from America. If you say I'm from America and Brazil, they get angry. They're like, no, you're from the United States. We're all from America. You can't say you're from America and expect it to define you. What I'm saying is we don't count north to south, right? There, the myth of the disappearing Indian is not about blood. It's not about protecting bloodlines. It's about ideas. It's about remembering and sharing the ideas that make our philosophical worldview strong rather than forgotten and lost. Does that make sense? Yeah? So in the end, I thought I would end with this. It's, I call it the corner of piety and guilt. And again, it's back to this idea of creative writing. Right Here it says, across the Colorado River is Indian Hill. That's where I grew up. The site of La Purisima Concepcion Mission, built in 1780 by Spanish explorers, it was destroyed in 1781 when native Quetzans, that would be us, the human, revolted, killing all the European males. Nothing is left of that structure. Today you see the St. Thomas Mission, where my children made their first Holy Communion, right? where we have our funerals, at least in part. It was built in 1922. Behind the mission is Fort Yuma. It was established in 1952. Here's the part to protect settlers, gold miners on their way. They actually were protecting us to a great extent. This is what I'm talking about, though, in terms of trying to be a good citizen when you know that you were not like African Americans, perhaps like a property of the state. You were an enemy of the state because you didn't believe in private property. You didn't believe in property ownership. You, didn't be you believed that the earth was sacred. You believed that animals de deserved to stay alive, right? And that starts to get washed out of you because you don't want to be that person that sounds angry and bitter. And this is what makes it so difficult to write creatively because you, it's, there's a very real danger that your earnesty and your sincerity comes across as a self-righteous piety, right? Because it's not your generation's fault that any of this happened. And so why do we have to remember history? Why do we have to bring it back up? And there's no reason to talk about the wounds unless we're talking about the future. And why some of these ideas that we had traditionally in our culture might be things that the rest of society could, could benefit from thinking about a little bit more, right? Okay. That's that. Okay, I'm not going to go into that. I was going to play you a video, but I think, what, how much time do we have? Did we hit 45 minutes? Maybe we should ask questions instead of reading anymore. Let me check my clock. I don't want to keep you guys too long. Yeah, it's been an hour. I'm just going to read one last poem. How's that? I won't get into the essay. It's too long. But I really, and I wrote this a long, long time ago. In fact, I don't think I've read this in 15 years, so don't laugh if it's bad. Dangerous Visions. This is actually from a dream I had. Geronimo gave me communion, and I wandered down the aisle, pews on each side filled with parishioners not noticing it was him. He whistled for his horse that came charging up the aisle, remembering to genuflect on one knee 
for the greatest warrior who ever lived, which would be Jesus. Eat my body, drink my blood, the crazy man yelled, anxious to save his people, willing to give his life. Only the bullets arrived, only the cross. Dangerous visionaries dragged their own death up a broken back trail of bloody tears. And with that, I mean that it's not easy, I don't think, to be that person that is the dangerous visionary. If we had lived in the time of Christ and we saw him out in the world, many of us would have thought that he was insane, right? And sometimes, that's what, sometimes it's healthier and more sane to be slightly out of step with society if the society itself is sick and it's not recognizing what's important, right? Thank you very much for listening. We have uh, time for questions. Yeah. Do you think, um, in terms of sort of modern social justice, do you think that more of an effort should be made to connect Hispanic populations with their neighbors? Oh, yes, yes, yes. I'm so disappointed. I, I can't say enough about travel and getting to know other people. It's, a very, it's very sad to me that on the reservation, if you leave and you travel too much and you get an education, in some ways, some people will mistrust you when you go home. They want you to stay and be frightened of the world. And I really think that the, the I really love the, um, the, the literary philosopher, literary theorist, Levinas, Emmanuel Levinas, who studied under, um, I think it was Heidegger, and his parents were in the Holocaust, in the concentration camps. And he talks a lot about how the revolution is this notion of learning how to love the other, right? Like rubbing up against people that are not like you in a way that is loving and open and gifting who you are to them and receiving who they are in return and maybe never understanding but at least being there to try to understand. That is the, that is the greatest revolutionary thing that any of us can engage in. And so if you're throwing up walls and blocking things, that's hearkening back to like uh, colonial ideals of separatism and like um, you know, knocking one person off the pedestal who's ruling everything and putting up another one. And instead, there has to be a dialogue. It's the death of the, of the huge, you know, it's the death of the meta-narrative. Now we know that there were many creation stories. Nobody's trumps anybody else's. It's all a part of the same conversation. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Um. Can you talk any more about the creation story? And you left us with you being a child, and it's like, I don't know what to do with this. I don't know how to make sense of this. Now you're older, a little bit. Uh -huh. And so, like, how have, you, how have you processed that? How have you rendered that? Thank you. That's a good question, yeah. I, I think a lot about this notion of the self-regulated man, right? I like the essayist very much. His name is Montaigne from France, and uh, he read a lot of, I mean, you could trace this back to Machiavelli, where they talk about how a society creates laws, but we live in this radically um, temporal uh, universe. Like, it's, it's always changing. It's always changing, always changing. So you think you've covered everything with the laws that you've made, and suddenly there's a new case with a new variable, and you have to add to it. That's why our law books get bigger and bigger and bigger. And they also talk a lot about how you don't know if a war was a just war until you get 200 years out. Because you need that long perspective to see, right? So while I love my Catholicism, there are some things that I can't, you know, that I can't accept or uh, support in it. So what it comes down to is being self-regulating, where I have to think every day about what it means to be a moral person and to be engaged in a world that feels honest to me. And inevitably, that has to do with picking and choosing. And I'll tell one quick story about a priest that came, probably about five years to do like a mission at our church. 
And he drew this symbol on the wall of this tree. And I've been drawing the symbol everywhere ever since. I just loved what he said. He said, when I'm in confession, I hear people come in, and there are people who are really conservative, and they're complaining about the people who are liberal. Then I have the liberal, progressive people come in, and they're complaining about the conservatives. And he said, and what I always tell everybody is, a tree has roots and it has branches. The roots dig down and reach to the past. If they weren't there, you would not recognize the form of the tree. That's where it gets its essential form, is from the roots hanging on and being what it is. The branches are always stretching out, though, and they're always thinking about tomorrow, and those are the progressives. And he said, the only thing I keep thinking to myself is, don't let one fail the other. Like, it has to do with this tensile strength, or in architecture, they call it tensegrity, right? It's like a pulling apart at the seams, where you're driving in both directions at the same time in some ways. But we are supposed to be a vine with many different you know, individuals. And we are supposed to be connected. So he was saying, there's room for both. And that has probably been the one thing that has kept me continuing to be Mark Catholic and, go, you know, and caring about it a lot in my lifetime. And is this idea that I don't want to be driven out by people who say that, that what I believe is somehow not in step with how they interpret their Catholicism. I don't want that to happen to me. I, I want to be able to say that that's, it was a huge part of my childhood. And now, of course, Greek philosophy has become a big deal for me, and Hindu philosophy, and Buddhism, and because I've traveled so much, and that's what happens when you get older. And the, the most important thing you worry about education as you get older is that an education always hurts you. It always harms you. It destroys your kind of, uh, your noble truths that you blindly accept it tears them down and it hurts. And then you have to recreate in a way that's more honest what you actually are going to believe and do. And if you're doing it honestly, you're going to keep changing. And that change is painful. So I waited a long time before going back to school because I didn't want that growth. It was hard for me. I raised my kids and I stayed at home. I didn't go back to get my degree, my undergraduate degree, until I was in my 30s. So it took a while for me to say, I can enter the institution without feeling angry. I can be a part of the institution. I'm very stubborn. So. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you guys so much for coming. Thank you.